Hello YouTube, this is Frugal and this is the PMDG DC6 Cloudmaster for X-Plane. Now the title of this video is a little obscure. Normally for a video like this I would put it up and I would say PMDG DC6 First Impressions. You'll notice that this video however is titled Your First Impressions. Let me explain for why as I spin the camera around artistically and show you the beauty that is this beast. I have access to this aircraft for about a year. I'm on the beta team for PMDG, so I, obviously I had access to the betas of this. I actually didn't spend as much time as I would like with it due to real life constraints, but regardless, I've, I'm quite familiar with this aircraft. So it would be very hard for me to give you my first impressions. Now, following on from that though, this is BMDG's first aircraft for X-Plane, and it's going to change X-Plane radically for the better, because it sets a new standard, I think, in terms of levels of complexity and detail for add-on aircraft that I think other aircraft manufacturers for X-Plane are going to be judged by, which is a great thing for us, the consumers and the simmers. It is at once, this little aircraft here, is at once, in my opinion, PMDG's single most complex, most challenging, most tricky, most in-depth aircraft they have ever produced. It is also the most accessible. Think back to many of you are watching this and I'm sure you, you've flown PMDG's NGX and I, I'm sure you remember pouring over the tutorial flights and, and figuring out everything and repeating that startup flow over and over and over to try to get it down. And it took, it took me at least many, many months. In fact, I started this channel by doing the tutorial flights for the PMDG 737 NGX and I used practicing to the, for those videos to actually learn how to manage that aircraft. It was a deep and challenging aircraft. This is worse, but you can actually just jump in and fly it. So this video is really your first impressions. If you're watching this video and you've just picked up the PMP, um, I can't even pronounce it. If you've just picked up the PMDG DC6 or are planning to, I'm going to show you the quickest, easiest way to get from A to B somewhat realistically, making use of a wonderful automation feature that is brand new from PMDG in this aircraft, which is not going to work. That the AFE, or the Artificial Flight Engineer. I will go through what he does and why he does it in more detail. Now, there's a lot to talk about, obviously, in this flight. It is somewhat a first impressions, I guess, in that the format of the video will be to show you things that you've probably never seen before and give you a good guided tour of everything there is to know. So there's a lot to talk about. It's a short flight. We are at Sacramento Executive, which didn't used to be Sacramento Executive. KSAC used to be just a general airport, and United used to fly the DC-6 from San Francisco to here. In recent years, however, it's become more of a GA airport, but it, regardless, I thought I would recreate one of those flights. Now, normally the flight would go from San Francisco to Sacramento. I find the uh, visuals and the scenery are far more impressive going the other way. So we're gonna fly from here to San Francisco. Simple. Now, you've just got the aircraft, you've just installed it. You're sitting, maybe like I am, here on the apron, figuring out what the heck do I do next. What you do next is click on over here. This is the Ramp Manager version 1.0, and it gives you access to tons of wonderful features of this aircraft that I will walk you through right now. So all these lovely exits that are open and highly detailed, and the ladders and the maintenance ladders underneath the engines, all of these can be toggled on or off very, very simply. Look, we just click on mechanic stands, and they go away, or we can bring them back. We can click on oil pans and they go away or we bring them back. We can close exits, for example. So front cabin exit, let's close that one. Oh, that didn't work. Why didn't that work? Maybe that did. No, it didn't. That's not gonna work. All right, I'm not sure why those are not closing, but regardless, ah, oh, there we go. Stairs are leaving. Uh, and then we can start getting rid of the cargo holds. They should be animating themselves close. It's very hard to see with that big old dialogue in the middle of the screen, isn't it? But they have actually closed and so on and so on. There are three handy buttons at the bottom left of this, cold and dark, which is the state that you just saw. So when I click on that, you can see the holds are opening here, a beautiful animation. Everything as you would expect from PMDG is here in this DC-6 Cloudmaster, including accurate animations, accurate sounds, accurate everything. It is a study aircraft, and I'll get into what that means in a minute. So you can go cold and dark, you can go ready for start, and it will remove everything, oh my goodness, and get the aircraft all basically powered up and ready to go. Look, doors are all closing. This is a plane that is about to go flying, which is cool, or you can even say ready for taxi. I'll go back to cold and dark for the time being. Let us go 
Well, I've been spinning the camera around, so you've been seeing this, right? It is an absolutely stunning model. There are a number of liveries. I'm not sure how PMDG are shipping the liveries out. We on the beta team had to download them separately. Hopefully they're included in the installer that you get when you buy this majestic beast, but I'll show you what they are. So if we go up here and open aircraft, you have a 6A and a 6B. In the 6B, the passenger one, we have American Airlines, ANSET, Canadian Pacific, Iceland Air, KLM, NCA, Northwest, Olympic Air, and so on and so on. If we go into the 6A, the cargo one, we have Everts, we have PMDG's house colors. There are 6C house colors as well, the cargo, proper, proper, proper cargo variant, and Empress of Suva. But we're not going to do any of that, we'll cancel. Let me go into the flight deck. This is where it gets stunningly complicated, and this is why I'm showing you this, your first impressions. The DC-6, as modeled here, has no less than eight fuel tanks. Now, when you're flying, particularly if you're doing long-haul flying, long-haul being somewhat relative for a DC-6, but when you're flying, you need to manage the balance across those fuel tanks. It is an ongoing process. It is well documented in the manuals. And if you don't manage it correctly, you actually risk weakening the structural integrity of the airframe, in particular the wings. It is a complex and challenging task. In addition to that, you also have uh, a number of cow flaps which need managing. They, they need to be managed and set to various pre set degrees based on the phase of flight you're in. Obviously, we have mixture to manage. Obviously, we have prop pit to manage. There are new dials down here that you've probably never seen before unless you have an interest in classic aircraft like this. These dials here, BMEP, which is basically in a nutshell, but not a measure of cylinder head or cylinder pressure as opposed to manifold pressure, that's kind of a measure of cylinder pressure, or another way of thinking about it is how much real power is the engine developing. These need to be managed. They are um, kind of affected by everything else, how much RPM uh, you've got on the prop pitch, sorry, how, what level of prop pitch you have, how much power you have through the throttles, and so on and so on and so on. You need to manage all of that stuff. Starting the aircraft, because it is a PMDG, because it is a study aircraft, and again, I'll explain what that means in a moment, but because it is a PMDG study aircraft, starting the aircraft is different every single time. If you try to start this aircraft on a cold, wet, icy day, it will be a significantly different experience to starting it as we're going to start it in a second. Well, we're not. We're going to cheat. Um, but it, it would be a significantly different experience to starting it on a warm or humid Florida or Californian day. There is a ton of stuff to manage. So normally... When you're flying this in the real world, you have a chap sitting over here who is called the flight engineer, not the first officer. He's actually known as the flight engineer, and he keeps an eye on all these complex dials and gauges and does stuff for you. That's what the AFE is. That's what this guy is. And it's very, very, very cool. And that is really going to be the focus of this video, showing you how to use the AFE in the preset states to get this aircraft moving, get it up in the air, get it navigating, and let this chap do all the hard work for you in terms of managing these complex systems. It is the quickest route to get you in the air and flying and having fun with this aircraft, which then affords you the time to go and hit the 400 plus pages of documentation and really figure out all the nuances of this aircraft, and there are many. So study aircraft, what does that mean? It means that this is not an aircraft that you buy for $15.99 and zip around the skies and crash into trees and houses and go, yeah, that was fun. This is an aircraft that is designed to give you enjoyment by studying and learning every facet of what it was like to actually pilot these majestic aircraft in their heyday. You are expected to read that manual, to, to really absorb it, to try things out, to learn how every system in this aircraft interacts with every other system and how to get the most out of the aircraft as a result of that. So if you are on the fence about buying this and you're not really interested in reading a bunch of documentation and all that good stuff, you probably would be wasting your money if you go and buy this. The real value of this aircraft is the study aspect. So again, that's why we're doing a quick start here. Let me show you how these quick starts work. It's actually very, very cool. By the way, the views here, I have views set up with X-Plane's default view system. Simply position the camera wherever you want, press control and the number pad key, it locks the view to that number pad key. And then you can simply tap the number pad key to snap back to that view. Anyway, if we fire up the ramp manager here, you can see we're currently cold and dark, right? If we fire up uh, this chap here, we could actually go ready for start. And then we could tell the AFE before start. In fact, he will actually get a little bit better than that. We can actually go from cold and dark and say before start, and he does even more stuff, which is kind of cool. Let's go ahead and do him now. Cockpit pre-flight. Complete 
completed. Voice recorder. Tested. Flight kit and ship's papers. On board. Fuel and fluids. Checked. Pressurization. Set. Manifold and duct pressure. Checked. Radios. Checked. Doors and hatches. Closed. Door warning lights. Out. Gear pins. Removed. Three on board. Seat belts and pedals. Adjusted. Throttles. Set to idle. Propellers. Forward and three. Before start checks complete. Start engines. So there we go. That's what the AFE does. Now, notice down here it says maintaining at any phase in flight. If you have an AFE state turned on like I currently do, he will be monitoring systems and maintaining the aircraft. Now, starting this is a bit of a beastie, so I'm not going to start it. I'm going to use one of the preset states to start it up. We'll go back to the ramp manager for that. So let's go over here and we could actually click on ready for taxi. But before that, let's look at the fuel. As I said, a key aspect of managing this aircraft in flight is actually managing each of these eight fuel tanks. And it is a crazy complicated thing. Once you get the hang of it, it's not too bad, but initially it's very daunting. So here you can just say, set fuel 100%, save settings, done. Or you can go in here, set fuel 50%, save settings, done. Or you can just put in a complete number up here and it will balance them evenly across all eight tanks and you're done. You can also set in the baggages here, passenger weight and so on. It's a very, very cool tool that lets you manage a hideously complex aspect of this aircraft. So I'm gonna go 100% full. Gives us about 76,000 pounds of weight, which is pretty good. It's not too bad and we're good to go. Now also another complex aspect of this aircraft is actually lighting. Look, there's two lighting knobs there. There's one there, there's one there. There's a couple more up there. There's a couple over there. In fact, there are a ton of different lighting <laughs> systems in this cockpit, enough to be bewilderingly confusing, which is why PNDG have provided on this here ramp manager, a handy preset for you to go low lights, medium lights, or high lights. And it will, it will automatically set the lights according to the level you select, which is very useful, particularly for you guys, if this is your first day with this aircraft, wondering what the hell do I do? So just choose a lighting level. I'm gonna go with the one that I have set there. And before we do anything else, I'm gonna go ahead and set up all my navigation. Now, if you're gonna fly this in the classic way, you're gonna use radio navigation. However, they have integrated the X-Plane 430 GPS properly. As in, you can enable the autopilot, for example, which would normally follow VORs and beacons and stuff like that. You can actually set it to follow the GPS. So that's what we're going to do today. We're not going to fly the whole flight on autopilot, except for when I need to talk to you about various other features of this wonderful aircraft. But I'm going to show you how that works right now. So we are going to do a flight plan here. And I always get confused as to what the heck I need to do here. No, go away. Go. Go. Okay, so we're going to key in our our flight here, which is going to be K. This is how it works. And I can use the mouse scrawly wheel if you've never used. I know a lot of you maybe are considering X-Plane for the first time. Now there's a PNDG aircraft on it. So this is how the GPS works. You could just point at the uh, click spot and then scroll the mouse wheel to get what you want. It is a little fiddly, but you kind of get used to it kind of. So KSAC is where we're starting from. And then the next waypoint out here is going to be uh, SAC, which is a, a VOR just outside Sacramento, SAC. Great, enter. And that would be the VOR US Southwest, yes, except, and we're gonna end up at KS, whoops, no we're not. I went too far, KS, all the way up here, come on now. I actually don't like this quick this scrolly wheel thing, but this isn't PMDG. This is Laminar and X-Plane. Unfortunately, it's uh, unavoidable. KSFO is where we're going, San Francisco. So that is our flight plan. Except now, 
we are actually going to follow, we're going to land on ILS runway 28 right. And I actually have charts here, handy dandy Navigraph charts. Here they are. So it says radar or GPS required. How handy, we have one. And we're actually going to follow this procedure here. So our initial approach fix is going to be a waypoint called Archie at 7,000 feet, then descending 6543 and landing on the runway. So we can actually settle that up pretty easily as well with the X-Plane GPS. So we'll go flight plan. No, we won't. We'll go procedure, select approach. Yes. We'll scroll down to ILS 28 right. Somewhere down here. There it is. That one. Enter. Vectors or Archie is the initial approach fix. Archie it is. Enter. Load it. Don't activate it. So it's just tacked onto the flight plan ready for us. Now, I currently have done this flight, obviously. So 111.7 is uh, the ILS frequency of San Francisco. We're going to swap that over. 115.2 is SAC. That's where we're going initially. And what we will do is click on this and make this GPS. And in so doing, let me get rid of that display. But eagle-eyed may have noticed a little GPS symbol pops up down here. Very, very handy for getting underway on your very first flight with this very very complex aircraft. So we're all set on the radios, everything's good. Let's bring up the uh, ramp manager once again. Ready for taxi, please. I'm not gonna go through the full startup. We will cover the intricacies of this aircraft in a complete series on this aircraft. It's that complex and awesome. So I'm just gonna go ready for taxi. That worked. Now having done that, let's involve the AFE a little bit more. So we'll bring him up and we will say after start, please. Start selecting boost pumps. Off and off. Battery switch, plane battery, generators and inverters, checked and on, emergency lights, armed, ground power, removed, after start checks complete. And we're good to go. So the next uh, checklist is before takeoff, which we'll do after taxiing a little bit closer to the runway. No more. To, no more to it really so we can just start taxiing once we actually get up in the air it's going to be quite a long flight even though it's only 60 odd miles the dc-6 is not a rapid aircraft so we're going to have plenty of time and i can talk through all those other menus down there and show you some of the neat things that they do but for now let's just start moving hopefully my throttles are all in sync i'm using a go flight throttle quadrant so i have four throttle levers they do occasionally get out of sync, but I find that to be more realistic, I think, than assigning one axis to all throttles, which, of course, you can. But then it just feels a little bit too clinical to me, that all the engines are always completely in sync. There's never any issues. I like them to be a little bit rough. I'm going to turn around here, avoiding the ambulance that is on our left, and try to turn right onto that taxiway, which I always have a problem with, by the way, so I'm going to go a little bit wide here. There we go. And we're going to taxi out to runway 34 here in Sacramento Executive. And proceed on our way. I'm going to show you a pretty confusing feature with managing the takeoff flow on this aircraft. This aircraft, the DC-6, was originally created in the 40s. It was the first aircraft to be designated as Air Force One. So it's a very classic aircraft, and they have terms that many people are not familiar with, like BMET, that I already pointed out. Like, uh, well, maybe some of you have heard about the next one, which is uh, M top, no, maximum takeoff, no, M, my gosh, I can't even remember the name of it. Which is maximum except takeoff power. So if you imagine maximum power for takeoff is one thing, immediately after you've taken off, then you have this concept of MET P, or maximum except takeoff power. Um, so we go to that immediately after takeoff, which reduces the power, obviously, um, to a level that could be sustained a little bit longer than max power. Then after we reach a certain speed, which in the case of this aircraft is around about 140, 145, then we go set climb power, flaps come up, and then we can start our climb. So initially you have a pretty shallow climb until conditions are met where you can go through those various power stages. And our flight engineer will help us with that. But before we hit the runway, let's go over here and click on before takeoff. Boost pumps. Boost pumps on low. Fuel selector and cross feed. Main tanks and cross feed off. Autopilot and carb eat. Off and cold. Hydraulic system. 
Down, forward, pressure quantity checked. Okay. Flaps 20. Now that's going to be shocking to a lot of you, right? Flaps 20. That's takeoff flaps in a DC-6. The first stage is flaps 10, the second stage is flaps 20. Flaps set 20. Windows of turbine. Closed and on. Controls. Dust lock released. Free. Pitter eater. On. Mixture and cow flaps. Rich and locked. Set. Transponder. On. Landing lights. Watch this. He pushes the levers down, then we have to wait for the landing lights to extend underneath the wings before we turn them on. Extended and on. There we go. Before takeoff checks complete. So now we can line up. Give it a little bit of power, start moving. The aircraft is very nice to manage on the ground, it's very smooth. You're not uh, it's not hypersensitive on turning or anything like that, which is great. It feels big and lumbering, yet somewhat elegant as well. Look at that shake. At a certain RPM level, you will get a shake on the main panel. And the cool thing actually with this beta is that normally on previous betas, we've not had access to the tech team. The, the guys of, of people who are qualified to actually fly these things for real, we tend to, in the wide beta, look at how they perform in a simulated environment. But this time around, we did actually have access to pilots of the DC-6, and it was so cool reading some of the messages from them pointing out things like how much of a shake there is, or differences with how a flight engineer would really manage things versus how the AFE is doing things, and PMDG have been very receptive of building that stuff in. Anyway, ready to go, so I'm going to hold the brakes until we get through the uh, 30 inches check. 30 inches stabilize. 30 inches stabilize. Nice shake there from the main panel. Very, very cool. Thirty inches stabilized. Full power, please. Here we Going go. full power. So we're letting bring out the power. Beam apps coming up nicely. Manifold pressures coming up nicely. Everything's in sync. So I'm going to release the brakes. We'll start moving. Set. V1 today is about 85. Cal flaps. Cal flaps set. Cal flaps just got set to 3 degrees. There we go. We'll pull back. And slowly climb. Now we're going to trim or establish the aircraft at about 140 knots. Which means we're Buzzer not going to climb up. out like a freight train. Gear selected up. Notice the AFE put in the gear up. Speed's coming up nicely. We are climbing, but it's very slow. And that's gear correct. Up, Letting that speed come up. We can't hold maximum takeoff power for too long. Got to get the speed up. It should be about now. Mito power. Mito. Setting Mito, Mito. power. 48 inches, 2600 RPM. I got that phrase completely wrong, didn't I? Mito. Maximum except takeoff power. And top. What am I saying? So having done that now, he should, as we go through 145, bring the flaps up. Pitch. Meter power set. 140. Flaps up. Flaps up. Flaps going up. And we'll start our proper climb. Just adjusting my pitch here. Flaps are at 10 now. Flaps are zero. Let's pitch up. Flaps are up. Climb power. Climb power. Setting climb power. I'm going to climb up to about 8,000 today. I'm just going to trim this aircraft for 140 and we will start our left hand turn to start heading out towards SAC. Now, the aircraft in manual flight like this is wonderful. Very smooth, also very heavy. So, you've got to coordinate those turns. You've got to watch the horizon 
and it's positioned on the windscreen and make sure you don't suddenly end up descending rapidly, which Clock it will do. Set. You really have to stay have on to top of the aircraft. Request, please. You can see the vertical speed indicator starting to drop already. It's already wanting to drop rapidly. After takeoff checks complete. Now, I, I've done this flight before and I'm not going to bring out the GPS, but the GPS is telling me right now about 200 degrees is where we need to be heading. So I'm going to turn this around to about 180 and we'll intercept the course that we need to be on. Watching my speed, keeping it around 140, keeping climbing as much as possible by making sure that I'm pitching to maintain 140. I'm not going over 30 degrees of bank either. The aircraft is fully configured at this point thanks to our wonderful, amazing AFE, which is what makes this probably the single most accessible PNDG aircraft ever, and that is an amazing thing. See, now we're following this needle to get on course. If I pop out from the GPS, by the way, whoops, you will see here 200 degrees. We're currently at 167. Needle's moving. We will intercept that and fly. And keep on climbing, and keep pitching, and trimming for 140 knots. So I start turning around now, back to 200 degrees. Trying to keep the turn coordinated. Try not to get too far ahead of that needle, which I currently am. It's 190, slow down on that turn. Still climbing on up. Still manual at this point, which is just fine. I will show you how the autopilot works. It is confusing. Initially, once you get the hang of it, not so much. There we go, just trying to bring the needle in a little bit here. We are very close. I should leave the GPS open. It'd be a lot easier to work with, wouldn't it? Let's just put this up here. We're only five miles away from SAC. And then it's going to be a straight shot down to San Francisco. But from the chart, San Francisco has a, an exclusion area around it, 25 miles at DME Arc. So when we're about 35 miles away from San Francisco, we will go direct to the first leg of the approach procedure for runway 2A right and then start managing the approach. And I'll talk you all through that at that point. All right, so we're good. I'm not gonna keep flying this many. There's no point. I really do wanna talk you through some of the other cool features here. So, down here on the right is the autopilot. First thing we're gonna do is turn on the gyroscope and then we're gonna look down here and click this lever. There you go, autopilot's now on. I'm gonna flick this to the right. Now autopilot is following GPS. And now I'm gonna adjust this here for our pitch. That's our pitch control, no vertical speed control just pitch control. You can do an altitude hold. I will show you that in a short while at 8,000 feet. And bear in mind at this point as well, if I pop over the AFE, it still says maintaining. He's keeping an eye on all these gauges and adjusting things as necessary, like cow flaps and so on and so on. Now we're currently under 140, so I'm just going to look down here and we'll just roll this wheel forward a little bit. Reduce our pitch, get that speed back up to 140. Ideally 140 to 160 for this climb. There you go. Speed is very slowly coming up. It's a slow beast of an aircraft. This is the golden age, the dawn of commercial air travel, and it's a beautiful thing. It's 4,000 feet. Pitch down a little bit more. Just nudge that speed there all the way up to 140. Zero, 140. Come on, airplane. Perfect. But if it goes over 140 at this point, we're fine. We're climbing at about 550, 550 feet per minute. It's going to be a slow climb. The aircraft does have pressurization. The pressurization panel is up here. You can go all the way up to 20,000 feet if you want to. I wouldn't. <laughs> this is a very long flight. It takes a long time to get there. But again, that's where, after you get through the, these initial flights, using all the automated tools like the AFE and the preset conditions, once you get through that and you're, you're done and you want a challenge, then you stop using that stuff, go hit the manual, learn how to manage pressurization, learn how to manage the fuel tanks properly, do that all yourself. This is an aircraft that is going to last you for months and months, if not years, a very, very detailed in-depth study. The aircraft itself is actually still used by Everts and a number of others up in Alaska. So there's some challenges there as well, Arctic flying and, and really bad weather flying, which would be very, very cool. So while we're still climbing, and it's going to take us a while, and we have 61 miles to go, let me show you some of these other things down here. So you already saw that, which is great. You already saw that, which is great, the fuel management, you've already seen the airfield. Then we have this. Look at this! 
proper maintenance hangar, just like in A2A aircraft. You can repair an engine, you can do that at any point. I could do that now if I wanted to. Repair my propellers, top up my engine oil levels, top up my water and alcohol levels, auxiliary oil quantity, anti-ice fluid quantity. It tracks the airframe hours, and this is per aircraft. So the cargo variants keep track of their own numbers, which is very, very good. Underneath that, we have this. This is another very cool thing. Notice I've currently got, because I'm flying in simple mode, you know, I've got the AFE working a lot of stuff. I don't want to break anything here on video. So I've got engine damage turned off. All the rest of the videos I do with this will have that turned on, obviously. It is very, very easy to damage these engines and then you have to manage the results. And it does fully model emergency procedures and non-normals as you would expect. Realistic start means it is tricky to start this in cold, cold, nasty weather. Carb icing, uh, carb failure. You know, those two conditions obviously are pretty much self-explanatory. AP disconnect sound disabled is disabled, which means if I disconnect the autopilot, I do get a chime, a bell telling me I've disconnected it. It just makes life simpler. Normally that would be turned on the other way, meaning the sound is disabled. Damage alerts are disabled. When you have engine damage enabled, you can turn on this, and if you do something bad while you're still learning, so once you've turned off the AFE and you're doing everything yourself and learning the ins and outs of this aircraft, you will turn that on, and it puts up a handy block of text right here and says, you've over the engine, or um, you over-boosted the engine is a real common one. And obviously, head shake down there. Finally, the final one lets you save and load preset scenarios, which we're not gonna mess with today. So lots of new features that we've never seen in PNDG aircraft before, which combine to take what is a hideously complex but challenging and amazing beast and make it very, very easy to fly. Hence this video. Everything I've done so far didn't require anything more than piloting and setting up some GPS coordinates and letting the air feed do everything else, which is, I think, for many of you, eager to get in the air as soon as you buy this aircraft, gonna be a, an ideal way to get you flying. And then later videos, of course, I'll dive into the complexities. So six and a half thousand feet climbing and up to 8,000. Everything is going good. Once we get closer to San Francisco, by the way, I said we would turn into our uh, approach for 28 right at uh, 35 miles out. This is a slippery beast of an aircraft. It is more slippery than the NGX. It is very, very, very hard to bleed speed. Once you actually get the speed up, and it will, once we get to 8,000, you'll see this speed start to rapidly climb. Um, once it gets up to speed, it's very hard to get rid of that speed. So do plan ahead even more than you would in a complex jet airliner. Make sure you're, you're really aware of what's coming up and how you're going to manage it. Or you will find yourself, as I have many times, too high and too fast when you get to the, the final destination. You end up having to go around. and It's just embarrassing. It's very awkward. Okay, look. So 7,200 feet. We are still 52 miles away. So plenty of time. And what we can do is, once we get to about 7,800, I will use these wheels again and start bringing the nose down and slow our rate of climb. Once we get to 8,000, there is a handy little switch. Let me see if I can find it for you. Here, altitude control. We will flick that up, and that basically is an altitude hold. It holds the current altitude. By the way, look at all this. There's your, whoops, wrong button. There's all the carb air levers down here, all the mixture levers down here. The AFE is currently managing all of this stuff for us which is fabulous. So many wonderful knobs and buttons and dials in here to confuse the heck out of people. It is awesome. Look at these, look, look, look. Crossfeed levers for managing that fuel flow I mentioned at the start. Very, very good stuff. All right, 7,800. Let's start bringing the nose down. So we're slowing our rate of climb, just making it easier for the autopilot to catch up with us when we flick that altitude hold switch in a second. 7,009, 7,950. And there's 8,000. So I'm going to switch the altitude hold. Switch up. Now we're in altitude hold. At this point, bring up the AFE again. Let's switch him into cruise mode. Set cruise power, please. Setting cruise power. You will hear the tone of those engines drop now as we settle in for the long cruise and the speed starts to climb. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Cruise power is set. And we're done. We're in the cruise. 
with 47 miles to go. So in 12 miles, we're going to turn onto that approach. Like I said, quite a short flight. Let me pop outside and show you some more of the graphics of this aircraft in flight, which I think you'll enjoy. He's flicking switches. What are you doing? He's obviously managing some aspect of the aircraft that we don't care about Cruise right now. Checks Cruise checks, okay. Here it is. Everything about this is so good. It really does raise the bar for what an X-Plane aircraft should be in terms of everything. The visual model, the systems fidelity, the flight model. Look, even details like this. Flames coming out, the color of those flames indicated that everything is nice and healthy by now. You can see a little heat haze here as well. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Amazing level of detail on this aircraft. I love it. But maybe I'm biased because I'm a beta. Who knows? <laughs> I can tell you seriously, in all seriousness, this is rapidly becoming my favorite aircraft because it is so challenging. My previous favorite aircraft was obviously the A2A B17, and I think that remains my favorite in FSX and prepared. But in X Plane, this one. It's got all the complexity of the B17, and then some. And that's a wonderful thing. Let's pop up here. How are we doing? Right, I'm going to switch over to the localizer of San Francisco, 42 miles out. Don't need to worry just yet about turning. But soon, very, very soon. And then you're going to see how slippery this is, how hard it is to drop um, speed along with altitude. It's a very slippery aircraft. Just admire all these wonderful gauges here. This is rapidly turning into a very long video. Hopefully that's okay. Look at these. Beautiful levels of detail, and the lighting, all completely customizable. Various sectors of this flight deck can have different lighting levels. It's absolutely incredible. I forget how many lights they said they've modeled. It's something like a hundred. It's absolutely bonkers. <coughs> how are we doing? 39 miles, so in four miles. So let's get ready here. So we're going to go uh, procedure. There is our procedure. We're actually going to pop this open because it'll be easier to work with. And again, roll this back up here. We're about 38 miles. Let's do it. We'll go activate the approach. And we're heading out to Archie now where we need to be at 7,000 feet. So, back over to the AFE. Descent, please. 26 inches, please. Setting 26 inches. Which is going to do absolutely bugger all. <laughs> it's going to lower the power, but you'll notice she won't start actually dropping. We need to manage that ourselves. So, I'm going to turn off the altitude hold. 26 inches set. Altitude hold is... Sam checklist, please. And while he's running the list, we'll start pitching the nose down. You're quite limited on how much you can pitch this down. As you're about to see. So we're currently descending. It's all good. But as the speed comes up, our rate of descent will reduce. You'll see. Descent checks are complete. We're just going to go down to 7,000 feet, so we hit Archie at 7,000. Now, typically in an approach pattern, we want to be also at about 170 knots. At 170 knots, we can go 20 degrees of flaps um, and really set ourselves up for the landing. It's going to be tricky, really tricky, to not only get down to 7,000 feet, but also then reduce the speed. Hopefully, I manage it. With 33 miles out, we have plenty of time, so fingers crossed. And this is why I decided to fly to San Francisco, not from San Francisco. The beautiful scenery here. This is all AL Pilot X free meshes, using free scenery for San Francisco and free scenery for Sacramento as well. There's the Golden Gate Bridge in the distance. We're actually going to fly all the way out here, then come around and come back and land over there. There's 7,500, 7,400. Coming down nicely. Speed is coming up, as you would expect. going to keep an eye on that altitude, then we will go into altitude hold, and you will see at that point the speed will not want to drop, even though we level off. It's pretty crazy. At that point, we'll need to take control of the throttles, but we'll do that a little bit closer to uh, the Archie waypoint. Seven thousand two hundred. Speed is slowly climbing up. 7,100. Let's get ready on that altitude hold switch here. Now, hold 7,000. Watch the effect of doing that on those dials there. Look, 
speed change is so subtle and so slow. So at a certain point we will need to take control, which means I'm going to need to grab the throttles. I will actually probably need to take the AFE here out of descent mode. Some of these modes he controls the throttles and you can't. Some of them that's not the case. I think descent he is. So I will need to knock that off and take over myself. But actually we're doing all right right now. We're about 196. I suspect we'll get down to about 190 or 185 and it won't go any lower than that. From experience. Well, as I said, every flight's different. The speed has actually come down. <laughs> My previous four or five flights with this aircraft doing exactly this route, it didn't. Which is great. So we're at 7,178, I guess, knots. So I'm just going to see if I can move the throttles here and get that speed to come up a little bit. Nope, they are locked. So that's what I was saying. So we're going to go into the AFE. Disable descent mode. Now I have the throttles. So I'm just going to power those up just a tiny bit here. Try to keep all my engines in sync. Get that speed back up to about 180, because it is dropping quite a lot now, about 185 to 190 for now. That's going better than I expected, which is amazing. But that's how you take control of the throttles. If the AFE is managing a phase of flight which involves the throttles, and they're locked, just turn that phase off, and away you go. Incidentally, so far in this video, I've worked through all the various phases of the AFE in sequence. You don't have to. If you want to do this before start, after start, before takeoff, and take off on your own without the AFE, go for it. I do highly recommend you use them in the cruise because that's just genuinely helpful. Um, in range is kind of useful. We'll actually be doing the in range checklist when we hit the RT waypoint. And before landing is kind of helpful as well. Although he does get a little bit confused if you've already set the flaps, and I probably will have by that point. Speed's coming up nicely now. But you can turn those off at any one point. So this is, again, for my part, I think that's what makes this the most accessible PMDG aircraft ever. You can just disable the automation that's helping you out in phases. So today I want to learn about startup, or today I want to learn about fuel management and the cruise. Just don't use the AFP for the cruise. You do all that yourself, or you don't want to, you, you, you do the startup and and all the pre-flight and the takeoff checks yourself, you know, whatever you want. You can genuinely ease into this, which is great because it is an incredibly daunting aircraft to learn. So we're actually looking really good. 12 miles out from Archie, which is our in-range checklist. Speed is about, what is that, just over 180, which is perfect. We do have a fairly rapid descent, which I always have a problem managing. Let me bring the chart back on over here. Here it is. This is about 6,000, 5,000, 4,000, 3,000. Should be on the ILS at this point. So at the Dumba waypoint, we can actually intercept the ILS, which is why I've already got it tuned. And the way we're going to do that is very easy. This left-hand button that says CDI. We're going to click on that. It's, that window keeps popping in. Go click on that CDI button there. That will switch it from GPS to VOR that point these needles come alive as ILS needles which is just what we want 10 miles out now 9 miles 0.9 yep 9.8 getting very close Seven point six miles. San Francisco is off to our right now. Just about there. All right, one mile out. We are turning at this point, so I'm going to let the aircraft turn. We are going to need to descend now, so I'll trim this forwards. Notice it did absolutely very little, so I'm going to pull back on the power. There are limits on how far I can pull back, obviously. We don't have drag out. And as we turn here, let's bring up the AFE, we'll do our in-range checks. Cooling turbine. Normal. Fuel tank selectors. Mains on, cross feed off. Fuel booster pumps. So he's managing our booster pumps, which on is low. great. 
We are descending not. Okay, so autopilot can go off now. Down. There's the bell. No smoking signs. I have the aircraft, so. In range checks complete. Reducing power now. There's 170, we can go to the flaps 20 at this point, which we will do. There's the flap indicator, right there. So speed's coming down to 170. We'll try to hold 170 now. Whoa, we are climbing, we started to balloon up because of those flaps. We're just trimming the aircraft. We're gonna be a little bit high. We should be at uh, 6,000 in Xyled. We're not gonna make that. Watching that speed. It is under the 170 I want, which is great because we are pitched quite nose down right now. Now we're going to G-I-R-R-R, or GUR. And then after GUR, we'll be at Dumble, which is the right-hand turn. On to final. All manual at this point. Speed's coming up, it's 170, but that's great, we're descending. At GUR, you ideally want to be at 5,000, so I'm reducing power a little bit more. Taking it really as far as I can. Actually, I don't have control of the power, so... AFE dude, off you get. You get off my throttles. There we go, AFE. Alright, lots of power coming off now. That's the lowest I can go. One mile to go. A little bit off course. Let's get back on course. Coming on down to 6,000. Try to maintain as great a rate of descent as I possibly can without breaking 170. Next waypoint is Dumba, 3 miles, that's where we'll turn right onto final. There's our 170, I'm going to need to pull the nose up a little bit, I don't really want to go through that. At Dumba, we want to be at 4,000, we're 2,000 too high. There are the runways on the right. Let me point them with the mouse wheel, there. 2.2 miles. So I'm going to switch this off now, we'll go to VLOC and we'll get rid of the GPS and we can just follow the ILS. So we're actually not too high right now, we're a little bit high but not crazy high, which is fabulous. And then once we turn on to final, we will bring back the AFE, we'll get him to do our landing checklist. Now. Flaps 20, setting flaps 20. Now we've already got flaps 20, so you'll see there's a bit of a delay here while he figures that out. That's fine, and normal. All right, I'm good on altitude. I'm pretty much on the ILS now. A little bit high, in fact. Let's go down. 20 flaps set. There we go. Mixture is rich, please. Auto rich. Mixture set. Speed's coming down nicely. Gear up and down, please. This is going to really Gear bring the speed down. down, which is great. We're going to land flaps 40 today. A little bit high on the glide slip. Gear down and locked. Three greens. Props. 2400 RPM. Just trimming it. Try to establish ourselves, and then we'll bring that nose up and really get settled. Alright, let's go flaps 30 now. And we'll turn off the AFE. I don't want him managing my engines now. 2500 RPM set. I'm not sure if you turn the lights on, I might have turned them off too soon. I did. Alright, so we're slightly to the left. And we're a little bit too low now, which is great. Where am I at my flaps? Flaps 30, which is good. We set my view. Go over to the right. We do have a bit of a crosswind here today as well. Now I can start bringing the nose up because we are nicely a little bit too low. So I put the nose where it should be for landing. And then to set that glide slope. As always with these big beasts, big period beasts, they are affected quite a lot by crosswinds. And they do tend to get a little bit lumbering at slow speeds, as you're about to see. The trick is to just stay ahead of the aircraft. Don't overcorrect on anything. Be calm, be considered, and everything will work out just fine. As the nose comes up exactly where I want it, now I can adjust my rate of descent with the power. 
to a little bit low, so just feeding in some power, just get back on the glide slope. Like so. And we're good. Maybe touching down just under 100 knots. And the aircraft does have reverses, not going to use them. I haven't bound up the keys to do that. And again, this is the your first impressions. I'm trying to keep things as simple as I possibly can to get you guys up in the air as quickly as possible and experiencing the joy that is this aircraft. So steps are being missed. Things are being simplified. Just to show you that you can still be somewhat realistic with this amazing study aircraft. There's the Golden Gate Bridge off to the right. Coming back on the glide slope now. I am pulling back on the yoke quite a bit, so we're going to trim that nose up. There we are. Definitely on finals now, a little bit off to the left. That would be the crosswind kicking in, so we're going to do a slight crosswind crab as we get a little closer. Something I actually quite enjoy doing in X-Pain because the flight dynamics are so good. Speed is perfect. 2000 V, I'm not going to go final stage of flaps just yet. I do need to bring the nose up again, which means I'm going to bring the power in at this point. I don't want to drop too slow on that speed. And we are low, so by bringing the power in, we reduce our rate of descent. Let the glide slope come back down. There it is. And then reduce power once again. Nice stable approach. Clouds here, by the way, are SkyMax 3 Pro. I am using the real weather connector as well from X Aviation, which adds a whole new dimension to X Plane. It's kind of like a simplified Active Sky Next for X Plane. I'm very much enjoying it. Where are we at? We're too high. Okay, off the power. There's the outer marker. All right, landing flaps. The nose will come up as a result of that. Still a little bit high, so reducing power. Just a touch. There's not a big turbine lag or anything like that on this aircraft, but you don't need to be over eager with power adjustments. Be subtle, be gentle. I mean, it's an old girl. If you push a little bit too hard, you will break the engines once you turn off all the help and when you turn on engine damage, so be aware of that. Nice and gentle, calm and considered. Now landing this is interesting because that landing gear those spindly legs that have the wheels on underneath the aircraft are actually quite long. So you tend to touch down about 10 feet sooner than you think you're going to. Oh, thanks a lot. <laughs> what the hell, real weather connected? Stop! Now is not the time. All right, a little bit hazy here in San Francisco all of a sudden. <laughs> it happens. But anyway, as I was saying, you tend to touch down a little bit too soon. It, it's a little bit like a 747 in that respect. You're, you're actually quite high off the ground here in the cockpit once you're on the ground. What are you doing? I think that's the sunlight filtering through the haze, giving everything an oldie worldy old-fashioned look. I'm not too happy about it. If it does it again, I'm going to cheat. It, there you go. All right, so we're going to cheat. We're going to move the time. There we go. Oh, I can't move the time. I had the time locked. So put up with the awful X-plane induced flashing. Sorry about that, guys. I'm not going to pause the sim on finals and figure that out. I think it very much is sunlight glinting off haze and windshield. Next plane getting a little confused. We are too high above the glide slope, reducing power. You crazy sim, you! Yeah, it's a level of challenge, isn't it? There we go. A little bit too high still, so reducing power. Increasing our rate of descent. Very close now. I see the lights. Too white, too red. <laughs> what is going on? <laughs> Seriously, explain. Why? Why would you do that on video? Seriously, there are times to do that and times not to do that. If you want to look your very best to the people that don't let fly you. Now, many of you are probably already, even if you've not flown the DC-6, are already saying, I was too slow, too soon. You're right, I was. 
It is a slippery aircraft and I'm a little bit overcautious as a result. But it works. And it certainly gets the new pilots among you running if you do this in principle as well. Yeah, that is definitely sunlight. Early evening sunlight. I'm flying real time, so it's early evening in California. All right, we're getting blown off course a little bit with that wind. We are too high, so bringing back the power. Starting to crab a bit. No reasons to panic just yet. Still quite high at this point, so reducing power. We'll bring the power back in to ease our rate of descent in a second. Here comes the glide slope now. So here comes the power. Got plenty of wiggle room for that. Alright, easing up on the power now, obviously. We'll start that flare. There we go, we're actually down. That's what I was saying. It feels completely wrong. Now at this point I could bring up the AFE as well and go through the after landing checks and he'll do all that stuff for us as well, which is awesome. What I'm gonna do instead is simply depart this runway. And we'll fire up X-Plane's amazing replay system. And give you a look at what that was actually like from the outside. Great, and we'll stick a camera on the runway. Is that the right wrong way? No. X-Plane got confused again. We'll fix that in a second. Level of detail there. Look. There's the lights. Landing lights drop down from the wing. And there's the nacelle. The little cubby hole that they fit into. Not really a nacelle. Beautiful. So I guess in summary, I hope this was useful to those of you embarking on your first adventures with a DC-6 to get you up and running as quickly as possible. Now after you've done this and practiced this and you've got it down cold, hit that manual and learn all the ins and outs and intricacies. In terms of my opinions of this aircraft, again, they probably honestly are biased. Like I said, I consider people high up at PMDG to be close personal friends. I am a beta tester for this aircraft, so yes, I guess I'm biased. I honestly do believe though. Really, excluding the bias, I think PNDG have done a fantastic job. This is going to change the world of X-Plane. This is really going to change the world of X-Plane. Because every other study aircraft now is going to be measured against this. You know, PMDG simulated uh, uh, fluid flow. How oil flows under pressure at different speeds and different altitudes, uh, sorry, different temperatures and different altitudes and conditions. Why aren't you doing it in yours? PMDG simulated every aspect of the engines, including the heat and the uh, manifold pressure, the cylinder head pressure, cylinder head temperature, and how will those things all interact? Why didn't you do that in yours? This is going to change X-Plane forever. And as an X-Plane pilot, I think that is an amazing and wonderful thing. It certainly helped FSX and prepared to have people like PMDG and people like A2A come out with excessively highly detailed aircraft there. It really has raised the bar, I think, for add-ons on FSX and prepared, and hopefully it does the same thing here on x -Plane. Should be able to get a runway view now. There we go. Love to see you. Notice the external sound is a little weak, so I'm quite a way away from the aircraft, but I can still hear those engines like they're in my ears. Hopefully that's a feature that gets added soon, or fixed, a bug that gets fixed soon. Not sure if it's a bug or a feature. It's kind of always been like that for me. I don't mind it too much. But it would be nice to have FlyJ Sim slash IXEG flyby sounds for this wonderful, wonderful aircraft here having a bit of a hassle with that crossbone there. You'll see as we pass over to the threshold, the crab wasn't a massive sideways crab, but it was noticeable. Now, people are going to say the light's flickering, that's a bug. No, it's not. The propeller is in front of the light, that's why it's flickering. You're seeing the light shining through individual propeller blades as they turn. The flickering texture here is, is an explain issue. <laughs> not really a PMDG one, we see that on all sorts of other aircraft and replays as well beautiful thing. Oh, hello. 
There's the flare. A nice gentle touchdown. Will be a slightly left to centre. Look at that. Welcome to San Francisco. So good luck on your DC-6 adventures. I do still have a backlog of aircraft to get through. I'm slowly working through it. Once that backlog is out of the way, I will be returning to this aircraft and doing more in-depth stuff in the same vein that I did for the NGX, actually, when I started the channel. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. We're doing the same thing with the IXCG as well. As always, my name is Frugal. Thank you so very, very, very much for watching. And until next time, I'll see you all very soon.